after services that we're going to do here at the West Side. Um, we're going to have our 7 a.m. sunrise service. How many people have ever been to that? Now, that is an awesome service. I went for the very first time in my life to a sunrise service last year, and I got to participate, and it was awesome. It just, and I only had like one hour sleep, and it was awesome. I mean, that's the Lord providing for you during um, such a busy day. Um, so we have a 7 a.m. sunrise service, and then we'll have our 9.30, 11 o'clock services in here. Bring your friends and family, um, and we'll also have an Easter egg hunt in between those two services. So it'll be a, a quick a quick turnaround, but it'll be great. So who's excited for Easter? I am. I'm just, it's always such a fun, fun day just to praise the Lord um, as we get to do every week. So let's stand together this morning, say hi to a neighbor, and we'll get ready and worship.
Yes, he's doing great things in in us and for us. He's good and faithful. And uh, we want to just praise him and give thanks to him this morning, don't we? Don't we? Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. setting sun his what his love endures forever and by the grace of god we will carry on his love His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Sing it again. His love endures forever. One more time. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful, you're so good, and you're strong when we are weak. God, we love you, and we just thank you that you've met us here, and that you are just filling us up with your goodness, and that we can lean into you and trust you. Even when the times are hard, we can trust you, because you are faithful, and you are doing great things in our lives here in this community, in our city, in our nation. And in the country, in the world. Lord, we love you and we thank you. That's your name we all said. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody. I was a little, uh, I was a little self-conscious when I came in. I, I noticed that uh, the whole front was empty. <laughs> Word must have gotten out that a little spittle comes from me when I, when I talk. I'm not sure. So you see these guys moving back. <laughs> um, let me, uh, let me start with this. So uh, we're in our topic this morning about leadership uh, from Core 52. And uh, we've got some questions that are tough. So what I want to do to start with, and I thought about this if I wanted to have all the leaders in the room please stand. But I'm not going to do that. Because I'm going to have all the leaders in the room stay seated. Good. You got that right. Everybody in this room is a leader. And what we're going to talk about today, and for those of you who are standing in the back, <laughs> you don't have a choice. You're just leaders anyway. Uh, you're forced to do that. Um, what we're going to talk about today is, is leadership. And um, the thing about what we're going to talk about today is probably the, the most solid leadership practice on the planet ever. And for those of you who are in, in the room who, who would maybe see yourselves or you've heard of yourselves as control freaks, this is especially for you and me, because I fit into that category. So the, the question that we're going to deal with today is, what, would, what do you do when you're the most powerful person in the room? What do you do when you're the most powerful person? person in the room. And when you think about people in your life who are leaders who you follow, you're going to apply what we're going to learn today to those leaders. And the question is, who do you follow? What do you follow? And why do you follow these leaders? And I would say those who you do follow, who you want to follow, they're going to do by nature what we're talking about today. And those who you really don't follow are probably not doing what we're going to talk about today. So let me get into this. We're going to talk about Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45. But before we get there, let me set the stage. So Jesus, this is uh, the late stages of his ministry. So this would be the third year of his ministry at the ripe old age of 33. He's gone out to preach. Now, remember, this area that he's preached in, that he's reached out to, is not that big of an area. So Jesus' entire ministry, if you think about where Evansville, Indiana is, to Bloomington and sort of draw a circle, that's about the circumference of what, where Jesus spent his entire ministry. But the impact that he had was massive. And so Jesus is at the height of his ministry. He's got a tremendous following. I mean, he has become more important than the Passover because he's got more people following and so Jesus is, it, it, Mark records this one day, and this one day has been talked about, preached about, uh, taught for, for over 2,000 years because of what, what happened here in Mark chapter 10. So Jesus starts the day out with uh, conflict from the Jewish rulers, right? So Jesus starts out, and they come to him, and they try to catch him in what he's saying and what he's thinking and what he's teaching. And the issue was divorce, and so they come to Jesus and they say, what does the law say about divorce? Well, that's a catch-22 because the law says about divorce, if someone has been unfaithful, right? And so the interpretation of unfaithful was spun all kinds of ways. It's still spun today. And so that, that specific term, they were trying to catch him. And so what he said was, uh, which, which he usually did. It took him about 30 seconds to dispel the catching of this, of this group. And he really talked about the heart of marriage. And he, and, he, and he really didn't answer the question because they knew by the end of it that he answered it. So Jesus moves from there and he moves on. And a bunch of parents are approaching Jesus as he's walking along and they bring their kids. And really all the Bible says they wanted to do is to have Jesus just touch their kids. The disciples came in and said, Jesus, you know, you don't have time for this. And Jesus said, oh, no, I make time. In the divorce situation, Jesus took time and set aside with his disciples and taught them about marriage. Here he took them aside and taught them about the importance of kids. The Bible says about that time, as Mark recorded, 
Um, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and, and he says, hey, give, I, I really want some of your moxie. I want eternal life. But what we, what we glean from this is that what he really wanted was Jesus' power. And so Jesus turns the question to him and he says, are you willing to sell everything you have to follow me? And the Bible says the man went away sad. Again, Jesus took his disciples aside and he taught them about the power that money has over people. So they're going along from there. The Bible says from there, then they went. And then Jesus started to talk to them about his journey back to Jerusalem, his journey back to Judea, the region. And it was in that region that he said, I'm going to be killed here. The the son of man is going to be put into the hands of men and is going to suffer. And then something happens that has always kind of confused me. So it says that James and John, the two sons of thunder, we understand why they're thunderous here in a moment. They come to Jesus and said, yeah, yeah, we, we understand the suffering. We understand it's going to be hard. Yeah. But what we want to know is can we sit on your right hand and your left hand side <laughs> as your key cabinet, as your cabinet leaders? So imagine that. Jesus comes in and says, I'm about to die. And we say, yeah, yeah, but that's fine. But really what we want to know is can we be on your right and left? So they're seeking They're seeking power. And then it also says, so Jesus set them aside and started to talk about those places are not reserved for me, they're reserved for my father. Then that says, they. so Jesus takes them aside, puts them on a rock. There were probably Easter lilies around the rock. I just made that up, but there are Easter lilies there and he's teaching, he's teaching, he's taking time. And then he says he gets up and then an argument breaks out. So he has to go back to the rock with Easter lilies and he has to sit down with his disciples because the disciples were arguing with one another. The 12 cabinet members start to argue with one another. Why do these two get to be the greatest? We deserve to be the greatest. I could just imagine Peter saying, I'm the rock. And Matthew saying, well, I have more education. And they're arguing. So this is what power does, right? This is what power does to leaders. We begin to argue for position. We begin to argue to be at the peak of the pyramid. And that's how our world saw leadership then and sees leadership now. And then we get to our text, which is awesome. In uh, Matthew 10, 43, Jesus says this, not so with you. And let me stop there. He says, not so with you. And then he goes on with anyone. If you're in the room or online right now, and you get in an argument about who's right Listen to Jesus' words. Not so with you. It's not how it is with you. So let me set your heart there because everything after that is is not so with you. You're following me. Things are different here. Anyone who wants to be important among you must be your servant and anyone who wants to be first among you must be your slave of everyone. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served but instead came to to serve others. He came to give his life as the price for setting many people free. And so we're in this third, 30th week of, of Core 52. Um, there's 52 weeks, so we're pretty far into this. And I have to tell you, this for me was a showstopper. Because if you're visiting or if you're hearing this, Uh, We've been kind of going through the heart of what it means, 52 most impactful teachings of Jesus, teachings of the Bible about getting close to God and changing our hearts. So this particular week on leadership, I asked the question a minute ago, what do you do when you're the most powerful person in the room? Now that specific question was asked on January the 12th, 2013, Andy Stanley, many of you know who he is, he was asked to preach at uh, President Obama's second inauguration at the morning church service, which is a a tradition. And he comes into that service and he starts to ask this question. Now, here's what's interesting. The media went nuts. Everybody in the room started to debate the church and the state, which is exactly what was happening with the Jewish rulers and the rulers, what Jesus called to the Gentiles. There was this debate. Neither of them agreed with Jesus. And today, church and state is pretty much the same. 
people are going to disagree with what we're going to talk about today. And so what happened in the media is that they frenzied up all of the issues that could potentially be wrong on either side, the church and the state. Abortion. Homosexuality. All of these major issues came out. What Andy Stanley said a week later was, hey, I asked a good question, didn't I? It's one that deserves an answer. It's one that you who are asking me the question should really consider every day. What do you do when you're the most important person in the room? And so the irony of that is that the, the media and everybody else made this out to be about power. Well, who's got the authority? And that's precisely what Jesus is dealing with in Mark 10. So power is beautiful. It's a great thing. It's also the most dangerous thing in the world. If you think about the disruption of what's going on right now in our world, over in Russia, over in Asia, here in our country, here in our church, power. Power is the primary issue. There are people who, who you follow who are leaders, and there are people who you follow who are rulers. The leaders are the ones you want to follow, and the rulers are the ones that you must follow. And right now, you can think about names in your head of people in your life who are leaders, and you think about people who are rulers. You think about Jesus who was given power, and he was tempted. The Bible says that the devil tempted him with physical things, make, make stones out of bread. He, he tempted Jesus with power on emotional things, and he, he tempted with, with power on uh, psychological things. And those are the things that, that we get tempted by today. So we are all a leader of, of someone and, and something, right? Because you all stayed seated. You said, I'm a, you said, I'm a leader. Nobody stood up. Um, the core issue of the, of the chapter today in, in Mark is about the environment and the, the source of which Jesus talked about dealing with power. So those five times that I mentioned in the, in, in, earlier in chapter 10, five times Jesus stopped and he took time and he set aside and he taught. Time is of the essence. Time is the issue for the leader. Our, our author of Core 52, Mark Moore, said it this way. What did the leader of all time, the goat of all time, the greatest of all time, what did he do when he was the most powerful person in the room? He put a towel around his waist, and he went around the room one by one, and he washed feet. The lowest position of any servant. Servants would have been, servants would have been common. Servants would have been everywhere. Servants would have been at the place at that last supper when Jesus took the towel and wrapped it around his waist. And Jesus said two things, become a servant. And then he went one level more. And he said, become a slave. 43 through 45 of Mark 10 talk about those two things. The disciples must have been humiliated. Why do we know this? Because what we find later on in Acts chapter 6 is that the disciples, the teachers, 12 of them, they couldn't pry their hands away from serving the widows. They, they couldn't bring them away. And they finally said, you have to move away and help us teach. Because they took this so seriously that they were willing to take on the lowest and the, and the most challenging of tasks. You're very quiet right now. <laughs> so am I. This principle of leadership will turn your world and mine upside down. And that's precisely why the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has turned our world upside down because of this principle. Mark Moore said it this way, any of us who dare to call ourselves leaders had better be proficient with a basin and a towel. And that is true. So we don't have time to unpack Every principle of Jesus this morning, we'd be here the rest of the morning. There are many. So we're going to unpack three things. Number one is power down. Number two, 
is provide safety. And number three is to do something that I just forgot. <laughs> but you're going to hear in a minute. <laughs> How's that for your attention? <clears throat> it's weird to stand up here. You should do it sometime. Jesus powered down. And that's one of the first principles of power. Is when you're the most powerful person in the room, what do you do? You power down. How do you give power to others? Jesus was always taking the power and turning it to others. So those of you who are uh, studiers, scholars of, of leadership, you're probably doing this a lot, right? You're, you're looking at podcasts, you're listening to, to, to videos, uh, you're, you're reading books, you're going to conferences. I, I did this for a long time as a leader. And then I decided, um, this is probably 18, 20 years ago, I decided, like, I, I just want to study biblical leadership. So I took a year, and I went through the Bible, and here's what I was looking for. I was looking for uh, statements and tools and methods where I could go into teams, and I could say, this is the method. And I didn't learn that at all. In fact, um, my entire leadership world was, was rocked to the core. Jesus' leadership principles completely leveled my thinking about leading with things like this. The first will be last. The last will be first. Seek the, the lowest seat at the table, not the highest. And my favorite, power is made perfect in weakness. And there are, there are scriptures, I put a few of these in the, in the uh, bulletin for you today, that, that are completely contrary to what you would think about as a powerful leader. I had a leader in, in, uh, in my company uh, from Korea one time who said, I don't get the, the leadership here. Do you not know that, that you, you, you have power to tell people exactly what to do and when to do it and how to do it? And I've always thought about that because I thought, no, nah, this doesn't feel right. Because it doesn't match up to, to what Jesus said. Woodrow Wilson said it this way. Power consists of one's capacity to link his will with the purpose of others, to be led by reason, and of gift of cooperation. So that idea of cooperation, that idea of taking a gift and making it about the purpose of others is what Jesus is teaching. Here's a true story. This is, this is always kind of like rocked me also as a leader. I was doing an interview one time with a candidate, and this is, this is no kidding. The candidate stops me in the middle of the interview and says to me, uh, look, I'm just going to level with you. I'm a pretty big deal in the world of marketing. So let's just cut right to the chase. I'm going to need a, you know, a mid-six-figure salary, uh, a corporate apartment. This is in Hong Kong, so this is a pretty expensive apartment. Um, I'm going to need a staff that I choose, and I'm going to need uh, an office by the window. So look, if, if, this isn't, if, th if this isn't really what you're going to have to offer, then we should, I don't know, we should probably just keep moving on. It ta if, for those of you who know me, it takes a lot to set me off. <laughs> it was about, by the way, it was about 11 at night, my time, so <laughs> I think my wife was in the, Krista was in the room going, who are you talking to? Because I was, I was, he got in my grill, okay? So I said to the guy, look, um, if you're this important, one, I don't understand why you're even interviewing, why every company in the world doesn't already have you secured up and locked into a deal, right? Number two, I'd be a terrible leader for you because you're so much better, clearly, than I am. And number three, you might want to think about the person that you work for next because what I'm feeling from you is the only person that that probably is going to be is you. Have a good life, buddy. And, and then I felt guilty. And I thought, well, maybe I worked in a biblical principle in there somewhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> but the truth is, this guy was willing to say it. And a lot of people think it. And a lot of people go through this 
stage in, in leadership thinking, you know, this is my title. I need a big title. There are titles everywhere. Chief, executive, doctor, none of those are bad. But one of the things I always ask is this acronym WWJD, what would John Maxwell do? Because John Maxwell talks about titles and says the, the greatest titles that you could ever had, have would be dad, would be mom, would be son, would be daughter, would be grandpa, would be grandpa, grandma. Those are the greatest titles. John also said this, and I love this because it has the one statement of leadership that has always really probably caused me to stop and think was this from John Maxwell. Leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. Leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less. How do you gain influence from people? It starts with giving them time. I want you to notice that Jesus in Mark 10, it may have been one of the busier days that Jesus ever had because the crowd swell was tremendous. I mean, tremendous. Said that he had to, he had to get out of crowds like a, you know, like a, uh, an ant getting out of a, an ant hill with an army around him, right? He had to find his way. But the one thing that he did five times in this short period of time is he took five chances to stop with the Pharisees, with his disciples, with the rich young man, with the parents and the kids. With, he, he stopped and he took time. And we don't do that. Our culture is, got to go to the next thing, got to go to the next thing. How am I going to have time for that? Stop and take the time when you power down. The debating rulers and all of the individuals, they had to have taken something away from that. And so what we, what we learn from this is that when Jesus says, I lay my life down for my friends, in John 10, 18, that the son powered down in order for us to power up. Principle number two, provide safety. The first principle of powering down that's, that's basically saying, it's not about me. Number two, providing safety is about you. It's a choice. It's a decision that you make. It's how do you make people feel. I love this quote I've always have with, from Maya Angelou. Um, um, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you make them feel. And isn't that true? Go to a funeral and listen to people talk about their loved one. They don't necessarily always say what the person did or said, this is how the person made me feel. How do people feel about you? If people were to write their remembrance of you, what would they say? This person made me feel this way. In verse 45 of Mark 10, Jesus said, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And basically what he was saying is this, I'm like you because even the son of man is going to do what I'm talking about doing. And that had to be a safety question for them. That had to be a, a safe feeling Two of the most powerful words that you can say to people who are struggling, me too. Me too. Why don't we go through this together? And that's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. I have a friend uh, who attends our East uh, campus, and this was early in the pandemic. He contracted COVID-19. He was, I think, maybe the first or one of the first in the church, and he, he got it bad. So his wife took him to the hospital, and he wasn't sure what to expect. I kind of knew he was gone. He, he texted me and said, I've got COVID, I think. I'm going to the hospital. Next thing I knew, he called me. He said, I'm in, I'm in ICU, uh, and I'm isolated. Like, nobody's around. And so we talked over the next three days. And by the third day, we spoke, and he couldn't talk. He said, 
I'm going to die. Oh, they're going to put me on air tomorrow. I, and that's about all I could make out. And I felt powerless. And I thought, oh my gosh. I, I didn't know what to do. I talked to his wife. She didn't even know what he was saying. And all I could do was pray. It was the only thing. I wanted to fix this situation so bad. My first instinct was to say, hold on, I'll be there. I couldn't. And you know people in your life like that? who've gone through moments like that where they can't breathe because there's such a stir in them of fear. That's power and powerless in the same situation. The only thing I could do and say was, God, I don't know if he's going to live through the next 24 hours. I, I don't. I can't fix this. Glory be to God. The next day he called me and he said, they're surprised I didn't have to go on a vent. And over the next several months, he slightly improved and eventually, and today he's breathing, praise God, and he's active. But he said, you know what? I'm never, ever going to doubt the power of prayer. I've never met anybody, I don't know about you, I've never met anyone that I've prayed with, whether it was a stranger waiter at a restaurant or somebody in this congregation or somebody that, that I work with who didn't say, no, thanks. I don't, I don't need that. You can stop and pray with anyone at any time. Praise God, we have the freedom to do that, but that's giving over your power. That's giving over your power to the only one who can make it right. One of the things that you need to, we all need to understand, and this, there's a lot of study out this right now. I'm not going to go through all the facts. The world is grieving, okay? The world is experiencing grief. None of us are escaping it. What's happened in the last couple of years, it's been just slightly over two years since the pandemic and the lockdown, with canceled sporting events, canceled church, uh, we're doing it online, working from home, seeing your kids having to go through things, yourself, your, your marriages. None of us are escaping grief. You have to stop and look at that right now. So uh, Sherry Cormier, who's a, who's a psychologist and a, a grief specialist, specialist, says it this way. There's a common grief that we watch our, when we watch our work, healthcare, education, economic systems, all of these systems that we've always depended on destabilize. In fact, it goes a little deeper. Grieving people are everywhere. Right now, if you've heard about this, the, the great resignation is a term. Just Google it. You'll see it. 48% of our country are either looking for a new job or a new opportunity. Why? People are grieving. People are unsettled. We're, we're all in some stage of being unsettled. Dr. Amy Edmondson, who's a Harvard Business School professor, coined this term psychological safety, and it is on the rise, especially in organizational leadership. Psychological safety defined as uh, the belief that anyone can speak up, share new ideas, ask questions, notate concerns or mistakes without fear of being punished or humiliated. There's a, there's a new rise in the need for psychological safety. I think it's always been there, but it is at an all-time high because of grief. Keep grief in mind because when you're facing people who might have an uproar or a, an outburst or don't squash the person, come alongside the person. They're grieving. They're grieving something. They're grieving someone. They're grieving something. Remember those words, me too. So when you're tempted to just fire back when something isn't going your way because you don't, you've lost the power, remember the words, me too. My, my good friend, Claudia Mitchell, uh, I think she's here. She's coming to one of the services this morning, has said something to me that, that will always stick with me, and that is this. 
People are going through depression and addiction and all these things, and you're, you're trying to get things done, but you should really never use people to get work done. Use this work to get people done. And it's the same in a family. Never use, uh, never use kids to get family done. Use family to get kids done. And you could apply this principle in whatever area of your mind that you're, is working on you right now. And I will say this as a side note. Um, this grief is real. So one of the things that Sherwood Oaks has done and will continue to do for many years, Claudia leads this ministry, is that we provide counseling. We provide grief care, counseling care, marriage care, mental health care, all kinds of, of care. Just this week, at three people who approached me beyond the fact that they're approaching others in the church with specific and tremendous needs, physical, emotional, psychological. It's everywhere. So if, if you have a need, I think I put this in the, in the bulletin. There's a, um, there's a website, but you can go to uh, gowestside.org or you can go to socc.org and you're going to find help. Come up to us and ask for the help. Everybody is grieving. What Jesus taught us is that there's no shame. There's no shame in coming forward and being vulnerable. In fact, what Jesus says, those are the greatest leaders. There's the, the most common thread today for suicide is shame. It's the most common thread in suicide is shame. Jesus turns this whole world upside down and saying, hold on a minute. You're looking at this wrong. If you're in a position of vulnerability, you're in a, you're in a great position to know me. That's the, that's the message that we want to take. Third and finally, this is actually the third point. <laughs> Practice empathy. Why did I forget the third point? Maybe I have work to do in empathy. I don't know. <laughs> How do you share others' burdens? This powerful, powerful word, empathy, is, is tremendous. What do you do when you're the most powerful person in the room with the most authority? Practice empathy. You practice empathy. Again, Jesus had this opportunity to share this meal, right? So near the end, this is on the same journey just after Mark 10, uh, Luke, Matthew, and John all recorded the Last Supper. We're gonna celebrate communion in a few minutes. So, so in that preparation of that, if you go back and look, Jesus went to great lengths. He said, there's a guy in this house, in this place, in an upper room. Go there, he'll be waiting for you, he'll help prepare. So there was a lot that went into this Passover supper that Jesus was gonna have remembering the Jewish Passover, that he, he is the lamb, right? So that was the end of the story. But imagine you are invited to the banquet that Jesus has prepared. And Jesus says, big day coming up, guys. Now, every day that they ate, everything that they did, it was, it was spur of the moment. It was a special time. Meals are always a special time in the Bible. But this one was really planned. So imagine you, you show up, Jesus you know, you're there waiting on Jesus. He walks in, okay? He walks in, and clearly, the most powerful person in the room just walked in. What did Jesus do? He went around, greeted everyone, made sure they were comfortable. And then I think, and, and a lot of scholars would agree with me, there were a lot of servants in the room. There were servants there because it was culture to have servants. Matthew would have had a whole team of servants by, by himself, based on being a tax collector. There were a lot of servants in the room. Jesus goes and grabs the towel and the basin, which would have been, what, the washing of the feet would have been the lowest position in the room. And one by one, and this must have taken time for him to go around the room. And so Jesus goes around the room, and what does Peter say? Not me, not me. Jesus says to Peter, you have no part of me unless you allow me to wash your feet. And of course, Peter, being Peter, says, well, then wash all of me, Lord. Wash my head and my hands and 
everything about me, if, if that's what it is. But what he was saying is, this is the life I'm calling you to. This is the life that I'm calling you to, the towel and the basin life. And Jesus wasn't conditional with his empathy, right? You think about who Jesus interacted with, the adulterers, the prostitutes, the sick, the lowly. He didn't say, I I'm good with healing the sick, but the lepers, they're on their own. So what do we do when it comes to our empathy? Are we conditional? I'm okay with, with somebody who's down and out and needs a hand. I'll, I'll spend time with them. But for the adulterer, they, they had it coming. For the homosexual, I'm not even going to associate. For the person who's completely lost in a, in a sin that I personally don't agree with, as far as I'm concerned, they're on their own. Now, let me say that that doesn't mean that you biblically compromise your position, but you can show empathy to anyone and to everyone. And so where do you stop? Where do you start? Assume the best instead of believing the worst. Another Andy Stanley, just, just to put, put it where it belongs. Do you assume the best or do you believe the worst about people? And again, the room is awfully quiet right now. And trust me, this one sits with me each day. We were talking to Mallory last night, our daughter, about this same principle. And it sticks. It's got stickiness. Here's a sister, cousin, brother to empathy. And it's four letters and it's the word tact. Now, when you look at the barrage of angst and anxiety and, and consternation in the world, there's a lot of tactlessness going on. <laughs> Go look at Facebook, right? And you, and you see a lot of tactfulness. The, the influence that we have can be ruined very quickly with tactlessness. One of the uh, statements that I have always appreciated and just saw it a few weeks ago, again, with Harry Truman, was tact is the ability to step on a man's toes without messing up the shine on his shoes. Isaac Newton said it this way, tact is the knack for making a point without making an enemy. So if someone's struggling with their health, you're not going to go probably talk to them about how great your workouts are, right? If somebody's struggling to pay the medical bills, if somebody's struggling to, to just make ends meet with two jobs, you're probably not going to go into that person and say, I had this great beach vacation. It was awesome. You should have been there. If, if you have a, an anniversary coming up, you're probably not going to go golfing that morning. Right, guys? Yeah. Should I keep going? Here's the point. If we look into what we say, we may have the heart of a servant, and that's our heart. But if you look into what you say, you, you potentially break a chain somewhere along the way. Especially at this time when the world is in grief, people will deep dive quickly with a comment, with a post. Be tactful. When I think about um, leadership, when I think about what we're talking about, you know, last week John talked about rest and the importance of rest. And I don't know about you, but that was a real snoozer for me. Um, I went home and just wanted to take a, you know, a holy nap after, after that. But it's important that we rest and it's important that we lead. I was with a friend last week who's a tremendous leader. He's in the church. He, he's, got a, he's tremendously successful in business. And I've always looked up to this guy for years and years. And we had a mo moment to spend some time together. And I was talking to him about, about today. And I said, what do, what do you think about leadership? And he said, you know, I, here's the thing I always think about. He said, 
leadership is like a chain. And I don't want to be that weak link between someone finding God and God himself. There's a role for everybody in the church, and I don't want to be that link that breaks and be the wrong influence. So I'm always thinking about that, and I thought, man, that's, that's spot on. Because none of us alone are the ones who bring someone to Christ. God puts it on their heart. He opens it. He has, they have many conversations along the way, and all of a sudden, they find themselves in a position to be confronted with the gospel. We don't want to be the chain. We don't want to be the weak link in that chain. And remember this. Joseph led from uh, slavery. David led from the fleeing of enemies. Paul led from a prison cell. John led from a secluded island when he wrote Revelation. And Jesus led from an empty tomb. He, he led when he was dead. Jesus is the only one who's ever lived to have led people thousands of years before he was born, the promised Messiah, and the only one who will lead thousands of years after. How did he lead? Simple word. He served. The, the word was diakonos, and the word literally is translated into deacon. But it isn't an office in the church. It's what we all do, who we all are. So let me finish with communion this morning, because I'm going to go back to the, I'm going to go back to the communion table where Jesus sat and washed the feet. And his promise to the room was this. I'm going to... I'm going to take my broken body and it is going to be poured out for you. So when you, when you meet together and you do these things, just remember. Ephesians 4.12 is one example. And his gifts to the church were varied. And he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints. That's us, God's people for works of service to build up the body of Christ, the church. What we do at communion is a building. And each week we, we take communion, we lay another brick in the foundation of our lives, of our hearts, but we celebrate each week communion because we've committed. We want to serve. Let me pray with you as we take the communion. Father, uh, thank you for this morning. Um, thank you for teaching us uh, through Jesus that the highest position that we can ever ask for or imagine isn't a title. But that through serving, God, you sent your son who turned the world upside down. And, and this morning, our hearts are turned upside down. Yes, it's challenging, but God, we all know that what Jesus was representing and serving was your nature. And so God, how can we do anything else? Help us in the moments when we want to go run to things and people and leaders that, that really only offer empty promises. When the only promise that we have is celebrated this communion time. And the one who said, I'll lay down my life for my friends. Thank you for doing that. We love you.
is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Oh,
we sing how faithful you are. As we lead others, as we lead in our families, as we lead in our workplace, as we live our lives, Lord, that we'd be more like you. Amen. You came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing, the King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering more of you means less of me take everything yes all of you is all I need take everything you are my life and my treasure sing a song as you guys are leaving, but Neil, he um, wanted to share a little bit with you guys. You can stay standing. Um, yeah, first thing you need to do is fire this preacher because he kept you about 12 minutes long this morning. So, 
But I want to just one one quick thing. Um, keep praying for John and the team. Uh, they're in Israel right now uh, on a trip, and they'll be back uh, next week. But we want to continue to to pray for them uh, as they as they journey into this tremendous. Uh, and I'm sure they'll have all kinds of great stories coming back. And many of you who've been there know. Um, also, we have a connection class uh, after the 9:30 service. If you're new to the church. Um, or even if you're online, please get in touch with the church because we have a, a group meeting to talk about how, how to get plugged in and how to serve here at, at, at Sherwood Oaks, soon to be Westside Community Church. And that's the other thing I want to announce is that you're going to start seeing uh, a transition take place, right? So July the 1st, we are going to celebrate as Sherwood Oaks, the sending of Westside Community Church. We have our capital campaign that we announced last week. We just launched um, the uh, GoWestSide.org website. You're going to see a couple of slides on the screen that, that kind of show what it is. There's an explanation there about what's taking place. You're going to start to see identity, uh, images, logo, that you're going to start to see a transition leading up to July the 1st. So I just wanted to announce that and let you know. And then also, uh, we just posted uh, on the website yesterday, and it's going to go out on social media today, a three-part series, mini videos. Uh, Mike and I got to a studio, and we just talked about um, the, the campaign itself and why. So take a chance to, to listen to that. Uh, be on alert for social media. And let me pray with you as you leave. Father, we're grateful for the calling uh, to be like Jesus. We don't do that well often. But God, we love the promise of leading like Jesus. We love the challenge of leading like Jesus. So be with us today. Go with us. Help us to take one thing that we've learned today from your word and apply it to our lives so that others might come to know you. And we lift it up in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great week. Empty hands held high. Such small sacrifice. If not joined with my life, I sing in vain tonight. And the words I say and the things I do make my life so sing. Bring a smile.
sign your name to the end of 